join me in analyzing how Luke, in Luke Acts, draws on and uses the servant of the Lord figure in Isaiah. First, a quick look at the servant of the Lord in Isaiah. There are four servant songs, as they've been called, in Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then 52 through 53. Um, just a brief note that the servant figure in Isaiah has been interpreted a couple of ways because Isaiah seems to use the Isaiah servant figure in these two ways, both corporately to stand in for Israel and individually as one Israelite who will come and be for Israel what Israel needs, will do Israel's work in this world. So there's this corporate and individual um, portrayal of this figure of the servant of the Lord. So in Isaiah, we get this story, and this comes from John Golden Gay's work, um, of the Isaiah servant. First, in Isaiah 42, the idealized servant who completes Israel's mission of mercy and justice to the nations. But then right away, a problem is raised later in Isaiah 42 because we hear of Isaiah's servant who is blind, not able to fulfill the mission. So then in Isaiah 49, we hear of the servant who comes for Israel, an individual who stands in for Israel to bring restoration. And then finally in Isaiah 52 through 53, that individual suffers and is exalted. Uh, and that suffering and vindication represents Israel, uh, stands in for Israel, that person works on behalf of Israel. As John Golden Gay writes, Isaiah 41 has told us that Israel is Yahweh's servant. And Isaiah 42, one through four, goes on to describe what that will involve. The problem is that we know that this servant cannot fulfill this role. Our assumption is confirmed in Isaiah 42, 18 through 25, where the servant is described as being deaf and blind. Isaiah 43 through 48 confirms that Israel itself nevertheless still has this status and ultimately this vocation. But in the meantime, it needs to have the servant role fulfilled on behalf of Israel. The task of bringing Israel back to Yahweh and being a light to the nations is unsystematically described in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. We can also trace how Isaiah's servant figure and Isaiah's texts about that figure are interpreted in Judaism after the time of Isaiah, all the way up to the first century. If we looked at Daniel in the Old Testament, but also later Jewish writings like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Wisdom of Solomon, and uh, others, we hear two themes that emerge in these Second, second Temple Jewish texts. We hear that Isaiah's servant is a collective for Israel, like we heard in Isaiah itself. And then we hear an emphasis on exaltation, even more than suffering. This might sound a little odd if you've grown up in the church and heard Jesus as the suffering servant. And it's not that the, these Jewish texts ignore that suffering, but they really do land the emphasis on exaltation. All of this can help prepare us for understanding what Luke is doing with this figure in his writings. The use of Isaiah's servant in Luke Acts begins by noting that the word servant, pais in the Greek, and from the Septuagint of Isaiah, for example, um, refers to Jesus. And we hear this very explicitly in Acts when we hear about God's servant, Jesus who acts on behalf of his people and also is exalted by God. In addition to this language that very much ties the servant to Jesus, we also hear various texts from those servant songs in Luke Acts. Luke particularly uses Isaiah 49, verses 5 through 6, both in allusion and citations, and then Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, that suffering servant passage. Let's hear how Luke uses these texts. First, let's hear what Isaiah 49, five through six says. We read, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and also bring back those of Israel I have kept. 
I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Note that this text is about salvation and it comes in a two-part unfolding. First, Israel itself is restored, the tribes of Jacob. And then, as they are brought into salvation, the nations also hear and receive salvation. I will make you a light for the Gentiles. That, that phrase will show up in Luke Acts at a few points. We'll also want to notice that in this passage in Isaiah 49, it is still Israel that's being viewed as the servant of the Lord. In chapter 49, verse 3, we read, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. So we have Israel's vocation now being worked out by this individual who will, on Israel's behalf, bring restoration to Israel and for the nations. So as we look at how this text works its way into Luke and to, into Acts, we can hear that there are allusions to it at a number of strategic points, in addition to a citation that shows up in Acts 13. We hear this um, allusion to Isaiah 49 uh, very early on in chapter 2 of Luke, and then we hear it at the important juncture at the end of Luke, Luke 24, and then Acts 1 in a kind of a parallel use, and then further along in Acts as well. So we have this text really illuminating for Luke, for his readers, who Jesus is. In Luke 2, we hear this language evoked in Simeon's exclamation about Jesus. He says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Here Jesus is the servant who both brings restoration to Israel and is a light to the nations. Once we have this firmly in hand, then we will hear the allusions later on at the very end of Luke and at the beginning of Acts to this spread of the salvation of God from Israel to all nations. In Luke 24, 47, we read, And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So we, there we have Israel and the nations included. And then even more clearly, out of Isaiah 49, we hear the um, important programmatic Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Luke seems to use this text in part because it has this lovely sense of the two-part restoration of humanity. God is going to work through Israel and specifically through the servant, Jesus, to bring Israel's restoration about and then to bring salvation to the Gentiles, to be a light to the ends of the earth. We hear this worked out programmatically in Acts because the mission, um, as it goes out in chapter 13 and following, go, um, Paul and his companions go to synagogues first and then move on beyond the synagogues to the Gentiles. So this two-part restoration is very important to the heart of Acts. At the end of Acts, we hear Paul speaking before Agrippa, and he says this, But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Again, an echo, an allusion to Isaiah 49. In Acts 13, we encounter one full citation from Isaiah 49, 5 through 6, and it provides a little bit of a puzzle or conundrum within Acts. Does this passage and its use of Isaiah apply to Jesus as we would expect? Let's see. We hear in Acts 13, 47, and Paul and Barnabas are speaking, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This sounds like the role of being a light to the Gentiles has been given to Paul and Barnabas and maybe to Jesus' followers more broadly. 
So the question is, does the servant role get extended to Jesus' followers in Acts 13? This question has been answered helpfully, I think, by one of our graduates of the seminary, Holly Beers. Dr. Beers um, works at Westmont College and did her dissertation on this topic of the servant in Luke Acts. Here's a few things that she's noted. First, already in Isaiah, the singular servant expands to the plural servants in Isaiah 54 through 66. If you recall, the servant songs are from Isaiah 42 through 53. So right after that, we hear this turn to language of servants rather than just singular servant. For example, in Isaiah 65, 9, we read, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah those who will possess my mountains. My chosen people will inherit them, and there will my servants live. As Dr. Beer writes, via the servant motif, Luke demonstrates a clear interest in connecting the mission of the disciples with Jesus. Let's turn to look at how Isaiah 52 through 53 is used in Luke Acts. There is a citation from Isaiah 53, 12 at the beginning of the passion narrative in Luke, meaning the time, uh, the part of Luke that really uh, explores Jesus' suffering and death. It comes at the conclusion of the Passover celebration that Jesus shares with his disciples. And we read, it is written, Jesus is speaking here, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus continues, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Jesus uses a bit of Isaiah 53 to say this is about me. And narratively, this theme of being numbered with the transgressors is filled out when Jesus is crucified between two criminals, Luke 23, 33. Across the Passion narrative, we hear other allusions or echoes of Isaiah 52 through 53. We hear Passion predictions of Jesus being handed over, parodidomy, and here we can uh, see this same language in Isaiah 53. We hear identification of Jesus as the righteous one, dikaios, again language from Isaiah 53. Finally, Jesus is identified as exalted, doxazo, from Isaiah 52, 13, the beginning of that final servant song. There we can hear that language of exaltation coming in both Luke 24 and in Acts 3. So it seems in Luke already there's quite a bit of elusive material to the Isaiah servant figure and also um, the citation we hear, and they all, all these come from Isaiah 52 through 53. We hear a quotation from Isaiah 53, 7 through 8, in Acts 8, where Philip speaks with an Ethiopian eunuch who is struggling to understand this passage in Isaiah 53. This is a passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch is not understanding who is being referred to, so Philip enlightens him by telling him, quote, the good news about Jesus. It's in 835. So clearly at this point, Luke, in his two-part story, is pointing us to Jesus as the one who is that suffering servant or suffering and exalted servant in Isaiah 53. One interesting question that's raised about Luke's use of Isaiah 52 through 53 is that there's not a strong emphasis on atonement. In other words, Luke tends to emphasize the exaltation of Jesus more than his vicarious suffering for his people. Yet, the theme is there, as scholars like Dr. Beers points out. Luke 22, verse 20 reads, Jesus' blood was poured out for you. He talks about his own blood poured out for his followers. And in Acts 20, 28, we read about the church that's been bought 
with Jesus's blood, his own blood. So we have all this, this sense in Luke Acts of Jesus's death as atonement. But we do want to recognize that Luke wants to use these texts as well to emphasize Jesus as exalted. And in fact, that's where the emphasis lands. And that's where the emphasis landed, as we saw in other Second Temple Jewish texts. This idea that the servant will be exalted is an important theme that Luke helps us to hear. And as Holly Beers notes, it may be that Luke doesn't overly emphasize atonement quote, so that the servant vocation is open enough to include others, end quote. So the idea that Jesus has a unique role in his atonement is certainly there in Luke. But as Luke wants to extend the mission of the servant to the servants, to, his, to Jesus' followers, he then highlights exaltation more than suffering. So a few conclusions to this idea of Isaiah's servant in Luke Acts. First, does Luke want to move the portrait of Jesus as servant to the mission, the same mission engaged by Jesus' followers? They are the servants who will take his mission to the ends of the earth. Beers argues yes, and I am convinced by that. Also, to note that in Luke and Luke Acts, atonement is present but not emphasized potentially due to that unique servant role of Jesus. He is the one who suffers on behalf of his people in a unique kind of way. Fi uh, another point of conclusion, vindication of Jesus as a servant is thematic. Listen to Acts 3.13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. The theme of Jesus' glorification, his lordship, is really quite important in Luke Acts, and particularly in Acts. And so that theme is something we should be paying attention to as we read that account of the early church. Finally, Luke finds in, in Isaiah 49 a really helpful two-part expression of what Israel was to do and to be, what their vocation was about. And the servant takes on that vocation, and it's a, a vocation to restore Israel, to restore his own people, and also to bring in the Gentiles. So Israel's restoration and Gentile inclusion become that two-part mission and agenda for all of that, all of what goes on in Luke-Acts and particularly in Acts. <music>